Chapter Four of Frederick the Great by Thomas Babington Macaulay. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. It was in the year seventeen fifty that Voltaire left the great capital, which he was not to see again till after the lapse of nearly thirty years. He returned, bowed down by extreme old age, to die in the midst of a splendid and ghastly triumph. His reception in Prussia was such as might well have elated a less vain and excitable mind. He wrote to his friends at Paris that the kindness and the attention with which he had been welcomed surpassed description, that the king was the most amiable of men, that Potsdam was the paradise of philosophers. He was created chamberlain, and received, together with his gold key, the cross of an order, and a patent ensuring to him a pension of eight hundred pounds sterling a year for life. A hundred and sixty pounds a year were promised to his niece, if she survived him. The royal cooks and coachmen were put at his disposal. He was lodged in the same apartments in which Saxe had lived, when, at the height of power and glory, he visited Prussia. Frederick, indeed, stooped for a time even to use the language of adulation. He pressed to his lips the meagre hand of the little grinning skeleton, whom he regarded as the dispenser of immortal renown. He would add, he said, to the titles which he owed to his ancestors and his sword, another title, derived from his last and proudest acquisition. His style should run thus, Frederick, King of Prussia, Margrave of Brandenburg, Sovereign Duke of Silesia, Possessor of Voltaire. But even amidst the delights of the honeymoon, Voltaire's sensitive vanity began to take alarm. A few days after his arrival, he could not help telling his niece that the amiable king had a trick of giving a sly scratch with one hand while patting and stroking with the other. The supper parties are delicious, the king is the life of the company, but I have operas and comedies, reviews and concerts, my studies and books, but but berlin is fine the princess is charming the maids of honour handsome but this eccentric friendship was fast cooling never had there met two persons so exquisitely fitted to plague each other each of them had exactly the fault of which the other was most impatient and they were in different ways the most impatient of mankind frederick was frugal almost niggardly when he had secured his plaything, he began to think that he had bought it too dear. Voltaire, on the other hand, was greedy, even to the extent of impudence and knavery, and conceived that the favourite of a monarch who had barrels full of gold and silver laid up in cellars ought to make a fortune which a receiver general might envy. They soon discovered each other's feelings. Both were angry, and a war began, in which Frederick stooped to the part of Arpagon, and Voltaire to that of Scapin. It is humiliating to relate that the great warrior and statesman gave orders that his guest's allowance of sugar and chocolate should be curtailed. It is, if possible, a still more humiliating fact that Voltaire indemnified himself by pocketing the wax candles in the royal antechamber. Disputes about money, however, were not the most serious disputes of those extraordinary associates. The sarcasms of the king soon galled the sensitive temper of the poet. D'Arnaud and D'Argent, Guichard and La Maîtrie might, for the sake of a morsel of bread, be willing to bear the insolence of a master, but Voltaire was of another order. He knew that he was a potentate as well as Frederick, that his European reputation and his incomparable power of covering whatever he hated with ridicule made him an object of dread even to the leaders of armies and the rulers of nations. In truth, of all the intellectual weapons which have ever been wielded by man, the most terrible was the mockery of Voltaire. Bigots and tyrants who had never been moved by the wailing and cursing of millions turn pale at his name. Principles unassailable by reason, principles which had withstood the fiercest attacks of power, the most valuable truths, the most generous sentiments, the noblest and most graceful images, the purest reputations, the most august institutions, began to look mean and loathsome as soon as that withering smile was turned upon them. 
to every opponent however strong in his cause and his talents in his station and his character who ventured to encounter the great scoffer might be addressed the caution which was given of old to the archangel i forewarn thee shun his deadly arrow neither vainly hope to be invulnerable in those bright arms though tempered heavily for that fatal dint save him who reigns above none can resist we cannot pause to recount how often that rare talent was exercised against rivals worthy of esteem how often it was used to crush and torture enemies worthy only of silent disdain how often it was perverted to the more noxious purpose of destroying the last solace of earthly misery and the last restraint on earthly power neither can we pause to tell how often it was used to vindicate justice humanity and toleration the principles of sound philosophy the principles of free government this is not the place for a full character of voltaire causes of quarrel multiplied fast voltaire who partly from love of money and partly from love of excitement was always fond of stock jobbing became implicated in transactions of at least a dubious character the king was delighted at having such an opportunity to humble his guest and bitter reproaches and complaints were exchanged voltaire too was soon at war with the other men of letters who surrounded the king and this irritated frederick who however had himself chiefly to blame for from that love of tormenting which was in him a ruling passion he perpetually lavished extravagant praises on small men and bad books merely in order that he might enjoy the mortification and rage which on such occasions voltaire took no pains to conceal his majesty however soon had reason to regret the pains which he had taken to kindle jealousy among the members of his household the whole palace was in a ferment with literary intrigues and cabals it was no purpose that the imperial voice which kept a hundred and sixty thousand soldiers in order was raised to quiet the contention of the exasperated wits it was far easier to stir up such a storm than to lull it nor was frederick in his capacity of wit by any means without his own share of vexations he had sent a large quantity of verses to voltaire and requested that they might be returned with remarks and corrections see exclaimed voltaire what a quantity of his dirty linen the king has sent me to wash tale-bearers were not wanting to carry the sarcasm to the royal ear and frederick was as much incensed as a grub street writer who had found his name in the dunciad this could not last a circumstance which when the mutual regard of the friends was in its first glow would merely have been matter for laughter produced a violent explosion maupertuis enjoyed as much of frederick's goodwill as any man of letters he was president of the academy of berlin and he stood second to voltaire though at an immense distance in the literary society which had been assembled at the prussian court frederick had by playing for his own amusement on the feelings of the two jealous and vainglorious frenchmen succeeded in producing a bitter enmity between them voltaire resolved to set his mark a mark never to be effaced on the forehead of maupertuis and wrote the exquisitely ludicrous diatribe of dr akakia he showed this little piece to frederick who had too much taste and too much malice not to relish such delicious pleasantry in truth even at this time of day it is not easy for any person who has the least perception of the ridiculous to read the jokes on the latin city the patagonians and the whole to the centre of the earth without laughing till he cries but though frederick was diverted by this charming pasquinade he was unwilling that it should get abroad his self-love was interested he had selected maupertuis to fill the chair of his academy if all europe were taught to laugh at maupertuis would not the reputation of the academy would not even the dignity of its royal patron be in some degree compromised the king therefore begged voltaire to suppress this performance voltaire promised to do so and broke his word the diatribe was published and received with shouts of merriment and applause by all who could read the french language the king stormed 
Voltaire, with his usual disregard of truth, asserted his innocence and made up some lie about a printer or an amanuensis. The king was not to be so imposed upon. He ordered the pamphlet to be burned by the common hangman and insisted on having an apology from Voltaire couched in the most abject terms. Voltaire sent back to the king his cross, his key, and the patent of his pension. After this burst of rage, the strange pair began to be ashamed of their violence and went through the forms of reconciliation. But the breach was irreparable, and Voltaire took his leave of Frederick for ever. They parted with cold civility, but their hearts were big with resentment. Voltaire had in his keeping a volume of the king's poetry and forgot to return it. This was, we believe, merely one of the oversights which men setting out upon a journey often commit. That Voltaire could have meditated plagiarism is quite incredible. He would not, we are confident, for the half of Frederick's kingdom have consented to father Frederick's verses. The king, however, who rated his own writings much above their value, and who was inclined to see all Voltaire's action in the worst light, was enraged to think that his favourite compositions were in the hands of an enemy as thievish as a daw and as mischievous as a monkey. In the anger excited by this thought, he lost sight of reason and decency, and determined on committing an outrage at once odious and ridiculous. Voltaire had reached Frankfurt. His niece, Madame Denis, came thither to meet him. He conceived himself secure from the power of his late master when he was arrested by order of the Prussian president. The precious volume was delivered up, but the Prussian agents had no doubt been instructed not to let Voltaire escape without some gross indignity. He was confined twelve days in a wretched hovel. Sentinels with fixed bayonets kept guard over him. His niece was dragged through the mire by the soldiers. Sixteen hundred dollars were extorted from him by his insolent jailers. It is absurd to say that this outrage is not to be attributed to the king. Was anybody punished for it? Was anybody called in question for it? Was it not consistent with Frederick's character? Was it not of a piece with his conduct on other similar occasions? Is it not notorious that he repeatedly gave private directions to his officers to pillage and demolish the houses of persons against whom he had a grudge, charging them at the same time to take their measures in such a way that his name might not be compromised? He acted thus towards Count Bruhl in the Seven Years' War. Why should we believe that he would have been more scrupulous with regard to Voltaire? When at length the illustrious prisoner regained his liberty, the prospect before him was but dreary. He was an exile both from the country of his birth and from the country of his adoption. The French government had taken offence at his journey to Prussia and would not permit him to return to Paris, and in the vicinity of Prussia it was not safe for him to remain. He took refuge on the beautiful shores of Lake Le Mans. There, loosed from every tie which had hitherto restrained him, and having little to hope or to fear from courts and churches, he began his long war against all that, whether for good or evil, had authority over man, for what Burke said of the Constituent Assembly was eminently true of this its great forerunner. Voltaire could not build, he could only pull down, he was the very Vitruvius of ruin. He has bequeathed to us not a single doctrine to be called by his name, not a single addition to the stock of our positive knowledge, but no human teacher ever left behind him so vast and terrible a wreck of truths and falsehoods, of things noble and things base, of things useful and things pernicious. From the time when his sojourn beneath the Alps commenced, the dramatist, the wit, the historian, was merged in a more important character. He was now the patriarch, the founder of a sect, the chief of a conspiracy, the prince of a wide intellectual commonwealth. He often enjoyed a pleasure dear to the better part of his nature, the pleasure of vindicating innocence which had no other helper, of repairing cruel wrongs, of punishing tyranny in high places. He had also the satisfaction, not less acceptable to his ravenous vanity, of hearing terrified Capuchins call him the Antichrist. But whether employed in works of benevolence or in works of mischief, 
he never forgot potsdam and frankfort and he listened anxiously to every murmur which indicated that a tempest was gathering in europe and that his vengeance was at hand he soon had his wish maria theresa had never for a moment forgotten the great wrong which she had received at the hand of frederick young and delicate just left an orphan just about to be a mother she had been compelled to fly from the ancient capital of her race she had seen her fair inheritance dismembered by robbers and of those robbers he had been the foremost without a pretext without a provocation in defiance of the most sacred engagements he had attacked the helpless ally whom he was bound to defend the empress queen had the faults as well as the virtues which are connected with quick sensibility and a high spirit there was no peril which she was not ready to brave no calamity which she was not ready to bring on her subjects or on the whole human race if only she might once taste the sweetness of a complete revenge revenge too presented itself to her narrow and superstitious mind in the guise of duty silesia had been wrested not only from the house of austria but from the church of rome the conqueror had indeed permitted his new subjects to worship god after their own fashion but this was not enough to bigotry it seemed an intolerable hardship that the catholic church having long enjoyed ascendancy should be compelled to content itself with equality nor was this the only circumstance which led maria theresa to regard her enemy as the enemy of god the profaneness of frederick's writings and conversations and the frightful rumours which were circulated respecting the immorality of his private life naturally shocked a woman who believed with the firmest faith all that her confessor told her and who though surrounded by temptations though young and beautiful though ardent in all her passions though possessed of absolute power had preserved her fame unsullied even by the breath of slander to recover silesia to humble the dynasty of hohenzollern to the dust was the great object of her life she toiled during many years for this end with zeal as indefatigable as that which the poet ascribes to the stately goddess who tired out her immortal horses in the work of raising the nations against troy and who offered to give up to destruction her darling sparta and mycenae if only she might once see the smoke going up from the palace of priam with even such a spirit did the proud austrian juno strive to array against her foe a coalition such as europe had never seen nothing would content her but that the whole civilized world from the white sea to the adriatic from the bay of biscay to the pastures of the wild horses of the tenais should be combined in arms against one petty state she early succeeded by various arts in obtaining the adhesion of russia an ample share of spoil was promised to the king of poland and that prince governed by his favourite count bruhl readily promised the assistance of the saxon forces the great difficulty was with france that the houses of bourbon and Habsburg should ever cordially co-operate in any great scheme of european policy had long been thought to use the strong expression of frederick just as impossible as that fire and water should amalgamate the whole history of the continent during two centuries and a half had been the history of the mutual jealousies and enmities of france and austria since the administration of richelieu above all it had been considered as the plain policy of the most christian king to thwart on all occasions the court of vienna and to protect every member of the germanic body who stood up against the dictation of the caesars common sentiments of religion had been unable to mitigate this strong antipathy the rulers of france even while clothed in roman purple even while persecuting the heretics of rochelle and auvergne had still looked with favour on the lutheran and calvinistic princes who were struggling against the chief of the empire if the french ministers paid any respect to the traditional rules handed down to them through many generations they would have acted towards frederick as the greatest of their predecessors acted towards gustavus adolphus that there was deadly enmity between prussia and austria was of itself a sufficient reason for close friendship between prussia and france with france frederick could never have any serious controversy 
His territories were so situated that his ambition, greedy and unscrupulous as it was, could never impel him to attack her of his own accord. He was more than half a Frenchman. He wrote, spoke, read nothing but French. He delighted in French society. The admiration of the French he proposed to himself as the best reward of all his exploits. It seemed incredible that any French government, however notorious for levity or stupidity, could spurn away such an ally. The court of Vienna, however, did not despair. The Austrian diplomatists propounded a new scheme of politics which, it must be owned, was not altogether without plausibility. The great powers, according to this theory, had long been under a delusion. They had looked on each other as natural enemies, while in truth they were natural allies. A succession of cruel wars had devastated Europe, had thinned the population, had exhausted the public resources, had loaded governments with an immense burden of debt, and when, after two hundred years of murderous hostility, or of hollow truce, the illustrious houses whose enmity had distracted the world sat down to count their gains, to what did the real advantage on either side amount? Simply to this, that they had kept each other from thriving. It was not the King of France, it was not the Emperor, who had reaped the fruits of the Thirty Years' War, or of the War of the Pragmatic Sanction. Those fruits had been pilfered by states of the second and third rank, which, secured against jealousy by their insignificance, had dexterously aggrandized themselves while pretending to serve the animosity of the great chiefs of Christendom. While the lion and tiger were tearing each other, the jackal had run off into the jungle with the prey. The real gainer by the Thirty Years' War had been neither France nor Austria, but Sweden. The real gainer by the war of the pragmatic sanction had been neither France nor Austria, but the upstart of Brandenburg. France had made great efforts, had added largely to her military glory, and largely to her public burdens, and for what end? Merely that Frederick might rule Silesia. For this and for this alone, one French army, wasted by sword and famine, had perished in Bohemia, and another had purchased with floods of the noblest blood the barren glory of Fontenoy. And this prince, for whom France had suffered so much, was he a grateful, was he even an honest ally? Had he not been as false to the court of Versailles as to the court of Vienna? Had he not played, on a large scale, the same part which in private life is played by the vile agent of Chicane, who sets his neighbors quarreling, involves them in costly and interminable litigation, and betrays them to each other all round, certain that, whoever may be ruined, he shall be enriched? Surely the true wisdom of the great powers was to attack, not each other, but this common barrator, who, by inflaming the passions of both, by pretending to serve both, and by deserting both, had raised himself above the station to which he was born. The great object of Austria was to regain Silesia. The great object of France was to obtain an accession of territory on the side of Flanders. If they took opposite sides, the result would probably be that after a war of many years, after the slaughter of many thousands of brave men, after the waste of many millions of crowns, they would lay down their arms without having achieved either object. But, if they came to an understanding, there would be no risk and no difficulty. Austria would willingly make in Belgium such sessions as France could not expect to obtain by ten pitched battles. Silesia would easily be annexed to the monarchy of which it had long been a part. The union of two such powerful governments would at once overawe the King of Prussia, if he resisted, one short campaign would settle his fate. France and Austria, long accustomed to rise from the game of war, both losers, would, for the first time, both be gainers. There could be no room for jealousy between them. The power of both would be increased at once, the equilibrium between them would be preserved, and the only sufferer would be a mischievous and unprincipled buccaneer who deserved no tenderness from either. These doctrines, attractive from their novelty and ingenuity, soon became fashionable at the supper parties and in the coffee-houses of Paris, and were espoused by every gay marquis and every facetious abbe who was admitted to see Madame de Pompadour's hair curled and powdered. 
It was not, however, to any political theory that the strange coalition between France and Austria owed its origin. The real motive which induced the great continental powers to forget their old animosities and their old state maxims was personal aversion to the King of Prussia. This feeling was strongest in Maria Theresa, but it was by no means confined to her. Frederick, in some respects a good master, was emphatically a bad neighbour. That he was hard in all dealings, and quick to take all advantages, was not his most odious fault. His bitter and scoffing speech had inflicted keener wounds than his ambition. In his character of wit he was under less restraint than even in his character of ruler. Satirical verses against all the princes and ministers of Europe were ascribed to his pen. In his letters and conversation he alluded to the greatest potentates of the age in terms which would have better suited Collet, in a war of repartee with young Crébillon at Pelletier's table than a great sovereign speaking of great sovereigns. About women he was in the habit of expressing himself in a manner which it was impossible for the meekest of women to forgive, and, unfortunately for him, almost the whole continent was then governed by women who were by no means conspicuous for meekness. Maria Theresa herself had not escaped his scurrilous jests. The Empress Elizabeth of Russia knew that her gallantries afforded him a favourite theme for ribaldry and invective. Madame de Pompadour, who was really the head of the French government, had been even more keenly galled. She had attempted by the most delicate flattery to propitiate the King of Prussia, but her message had drawn from him only dry and sarcastic replies. The Empress Queen took a very different course. Though the haughtiest of princesses, though the most austere of matrons, she forgot in her thirst for revenge both the dignity of her race and the purity of her character, and condescended to flatter the low-born and low-minded concubine, who, having acquired influence by prostituting herself, retained it by prostituting others. Maria Theresa actually wrote with her own hand a note, full of expressions of esteem and friendship, to her dear cousin, the daughter of the butcher Poisson, the wife of the publican Detiole, the kidnapper of young girls for the haram of an old rake, a strange cousin for the descendant of so many emperors of the West. The mistress was completely gained over, and easily carried her point with Louis, who had, indeed, wrongs of his own to resent. His feelings were not quick, but contempt, says the Eastern proverb, pierces even through the shell of the tortoise, and neither prudence nor decorum had ever restrained Frederick from expressing his measureless contempt for the sloth, the imbecility, and the baseness of Louis. France was thus induced to join the coalition, and the example of France determined the conduct of Sweden, then completely subject to French influence. The enemies of Frederick were surely strong enough to attack him openly, but they were desirous to add to all their other advantages the advantage of a surprise. He was not, however, a man to be taken off his guard. He had tools in every court, and he now received from Vienna, from Dresden, and from Paris accounts so circumstantial and so consistent that he could not doubt of his danger. He learnt that he was to be assailed at once by France, Austria, Russia, Saxony, Sweden, and the Germanic body, that the greater part of his dominions was to be portioned out among his enemies, that France, which from her geographical position could not directly share in his spoils, was to receive an equivalent in the Netherlands, that Austria was to have Silesia, and that Tsarina, East Prussia, that Augustus of Saxony expected Magdeburg, and that Sweden would be rewarded with part of Pomerania. If these designs succeeded, the house of Brandenburg would at once sink in the European system to a place lower than that of the Duke of Württemberg or the Margrave of Baden. And what hope was there that these designs would fail? No such union of the continental powers had been seen for ages. A less formidable confederacy had, in a week, conquered all the provinces of Venice, when Venice was at the height of power, wealth, and glory. A less formidable confederacy had compelled Louis the Fourteenth to bow down his haughty head to the very earth. 
a less formidable confederacy has within our own memory subjugated a still mightier empire and abased a still prouder name such odds had never been heard of in war the people whom frederick ruled were not five millions the population of the countries which were leagued against him amounted to a hundred millions the disproportion in wealth was at least equally great small communities actuated by strong sentiments of patriotism or loyalty have sometimes made head against great monarchies weakened by factions and discontents but small as was frederick's kingdom it probably contained a greater number of disaffected subjects than were to be found in all the states of his enemies silesia formed a fourth part of his dominions and from the silesians born under austrian princes the utmost that he could expect was apathy from the silesian catholics he could hardly expect anything but resistance End of chapter four